Good morning, you guys. We like to think of life as so permanent, and life is not permanent. Things change all the time. Our financial system, the way that um, our political system, our religious systems, and even the relationship between the sexes. Um, so I'm going to be using this book as a walk through time of the great changes we've had in the power of women, the power of men, how we relate to each other. And this is like a really important video. I'm going to actually make this video in long form and then I'll summarize it into a shorter clip for those who don't like to watch long videos. But I think that we are, what we are experiencing in all we're talking about you know, people don't want to get into relationships anymore. They don't want to be married. We're at the cusp of a new type of relating. And if you look through history, the way that we relate has changed so many times. So let's keep that in mind as we figure out how to go forward. And then on a related topic, you know, our financial system is also going to go through a, you know, a great reset with the central digital bank currency because we've been working on, since we went off the gold standard, um, we've been creating fiat money and just printing money and th for the first time in history we did not rely on gold and actual resources to trade. We just made money out of thin air and that led to the greatest prosperity that humans have ever had, especially in the U.S. because we are, have the dollar as the reserve currency. So we have really prospered. And then people look back to their parents and grandparents and think they should have that too, but you can't. By the way, our grandparents lived through the Great Depression. When Nixon took us off the gold standard in the 60s and allowed us to print paper money, we set in this great era of prosperity, which by its very nature was going to be short-lived, you guys. And so I do not trust the stock market. I do not trust the banks just because, not because I'm like fear-based, but because I'm reality-based. Like we are on a shaky foundation with no real, there's nothing backing all this fiat money. So they're just creating more and creating debt. And so people have made money, but it's unsustainable. It's gonna come to an end. We don't know when, we don't know how. And so that's why I really like people like Ron Paul and you know, people who are really talking about this. Um, so, but in this video now, and this is just because things change. Empires rise, empires decline. You know, we had the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire and the British Empire and the U.S. Empire. And now we're going to go more maybe to the China and Brick Empire, you know, but these things kind of shift slowly over time and people want to cling to this security of like i own this woman the body count guys i own this woman or we want to cling to relationships or we want to cling to our houses but if you listen to Eckhart Tolle and if you actually look through history you know everything is impermanent everything is changing and this scares the shit out of people it's scary to us we want security but life has a flow to it. There are even rocks and mountains that we, we, we thought were impermeable, they change. <laughs> everything's changing, everything's growing, and so we can't cling to things so tightly. No, that's scary. We all want to cling to things so tightly, but that's not the nature of life. Okay, we know that things change. There's nothing wrong in change. It's the nature of life to change. And life isn't here to make us secure. Life is here to help us grow. So with that as a foreword, um, let's talk about the women's history of the world. Now, I do want to say before I start out with this, the chief focuses on women's place in the world. But I want you to know that even though women have been oppressed throughout history, so have men. Men and women have been oppressed throughout history. The only people that were not oppressed were the top 1 or 2%, the emperors, the conquerors, the kings, you know, in our case, the politicians, the elite, the oligarchy, the kings, they were at the top of everyone. So men have been oppressed too. I want you to know that men have been oppressed too. But 
when it comes to the relations between men and women, women were more often suppressed and they have been until recently and were just starting to rise up. And this is causing a lot of discomfort because so many men are still suppressed. They're economically suppressed. So they don't feel like they have any power either. Um, so, you know, but this book is specifically focusing on women, not on suppression of the masses. Okay, I'm going to make chapter titles on this one. So I'm going to grab a pen so I can mark where I start a new chapter. I'll be right back. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the first woman in early civilization and tribal life. So in fact, it was the women that gathered 80% of the food and they were very busy. They were occupied from dawn until dusk. And they died by the time they were 20. So what were they doing? Here's just a list of things they did. Make sure you can read this. They gathered food, took care of the children, did leather work, they made garments, cooking, pottery, weaving grasses, reeds, and barks for baskets, fashioning beads and ornaments from teeth or bone, construction of shelters, temporary or permanent, tool making for a variety of uses, stone scrapers for skin, sharp stone blades for cutting on animal sinews for garment making, medical application of plants of, and herbs for everything from healing to abortion. At no point in prehistory did women with or without their children rely on their hunting males for food. So this is a great myth that we have, right? That men were the hunters and women were these passive beings that were these submissive females and their feminine energy sitting around the campfire. There was nothing true about that because it was very rare for men to even catch anything. And by the way, what the men caught, they were not like these ferocious warriors uh, charging against lions and battling with bears. They were mostly hunting um, injured, pregnant, or old um, game. Sorry, guys. So women produce as much as 80% of the tribe's total food intake on a daily basis. I want you guys to really feel the power of women as very physically strong, capable, and very intelligent because this successful gathering demanded discrimination, evaluation, and memory, and a range of seeds, nutshells, and grasses discovered at primitive sites in Africa indicate that careful and knowledgeable selection, rather than random gleaning, dictated the choice. Anthropologist's fixation on man the hunter has designated the first tools as weapons of the hunt. But since hunting was a much later development, earlier still would have been the bones, stones, or lengths of wood used as aids to gathering for scratching up roots and tubers or for pulverizing woody vegetation for ease of chewing. So very few of the earlier tools have survived to tell the tale of women's ingenuity and resourcefulness. Archaeology is likewise silent on the subject of another female invention, the early woman gatherer's swag bag. I hope I said that right. The container she must have devised to carry back to the camp all that she had found, forged, caught, or dug up in the course of her day's hunting. Because the volume of food needed would have been impossible for her to just carry in her hands or in her clothing. Now women were also primarily in charge of infants and nursing and carrying the babies around. Too much attention has been given to skills required by hunting and too little to the skills required for gathering and the raising of dependent young. I just want to really go a little bit more into this myth of man the hunter supporting all these women because if it wasn't for these women, 
the race would have died out. It was women that were mostly in charge of the food production and raising the children. The men contributed very little. They contributed very little. They contributed their sperm, and that's about it, guys. Sorry to squash you. Um, I think that we have really minimized the role of women in mothering and food production. So this is where I want you ladies to really get your power, that we were not like these submissive beings cowered around the campfire. We were powerful creators of life and sustenance. We built shelters. We gathered food. I'm just repeating myself. Let's continue. Women's invention of food sharing as part of the extended care of their children must have been at least as important a step toward group cooperation and social organization as the work of man, the hunter and leader running his band. Women's work as mothers of human infants who need a long growing space for postnatal development also involves them in numerous other aspects of maternal care sheltering, comforting, diverting, in play and in social activity with other mothers and other young. All these are decisively shown by modern psychology to enhance what we call IQ. It must have been of critical value in assisting or branching away from the great apes in mental and conceptual ability. Female parents are not the only ones who can comfort, stimulate, or play. But all these activities are very far removed from the supposed role of hunting, killing, primitive man. Nor does the significance of the mother-child bond end there in the myth of man the hunter. He invents the family by impregnating his mate and stashing her away in the cave to mind the fire. He creates the basic human social unit which he then maintains by his hunting and killing. I want to repeat that. Um, the, you know, the big daddy scenario of um, males to their hunting range and females to their home site, kind of like the guys at the office and the woman is in the home, like it's always been this way, like man is out hunting and woman is cuddled around the campfire is a myth. The man the hunter myth goes he impregnates his mate and stashes her away in the cave to mind the fire. So he creates the basic human social unit and he maintains this by his hunting and killing. But in contradiction to this big daddy scenario, a mass of evidence shows that the earliest families consisted of females and their children since all tribal hunting societies were centered on and organized through the mother. The young males either left or were driven out. Now the great evolutionary leap forward, according to her, was not hunting because we know that hunting only produced 20% of the food, which uh, she gets into here at some point, I think, where she's talking about how most of what these men caught were animals that were either pregnant, old, or injured. Okay? So, the great leap forward was actually menstruation because all the other animals that come into heat can only produce offspring a few times a year. And... For example, the great female primates like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans come in heat rarely and produce one infant every five or six years, which puts the species at great risk of extinction. It was actually the, um, the female uh, uh, menstruation was the great evolutionary leap forward because it gave a woman, it gave humans 12 chances of conceiving every year instead of one every five years. So the human female has a reproductive capacity 60 times higher than that of her primate sisters. And again, it's the women's menstruation that was a great leap forward. It wasn't your guys' penises or your guys' sperm. Um, and I'm not trying to put men down. I'm just trying to say that 
women have been put down in, uh, when they shouldn't have been, okay? So recent commentators have argued that women's so-called curse operated to cure not only man's shortage of offspring, but also his primeval mental darkness. So again, what history gets wrong is they make it seem like it was hunting and cooking that was the great leap forward, but in fact it was female menstruation. Instead, generations of male commentators have blinded themselves to the facts and the significant implications of the evolution of early woman. They have insisted instead on rewriting primitive woman as no more than a sexual vehicle for man. All right, and in this, every aspect of her bodily development took place for man's benefit, not her own. In the last of the, his evolutionary incarnations, man the hunter has now become a sexual athlete and rutting ape, while woman, receptive and responsive for 365 days of the year, awaits his return to display her newfound repertoire of fun tricks with breasts and clitoris. The Pleistocene Playmate of the Month. <laughs> the notion of man the hunter unpacks to reveal a number of other elements that feed and flatter male fantasies of violence and destruction. Because man's part in the survival of the species was actually more normal and more admirable and more natural. In fact, it, he was essentially cooperative. Early human life was essentially cooperative, where hunting was a whole group activity, not a heroic solo, solo adventure. To this day, all members of hunting societies, including women and children, join in hunting and beating activities as a matter of course. In their own right, two women have long been known to hunt smaller or safer animals. Hunting did not mean fighting. The first humans, as Shackley shows, worked together to avoid having to face and do battle with their prey. They drove animals over cliffs. And they often Im impaled animals on stakes in a pit, a practice still known worldwide. This method of hunting did not even involve killing as the animal could be left to die. Most forms of hunting did not in fact involve direct aggression, personal combat, or a struggle to the death but involved preying on slow-moving creatures like turtles, on wounded or sick animals, on females about to give birth, or on carcasses killed and abandoned by other fiercer predators. Men and women actually also relied on each other's skills before, during, and after the hunt. Hunting man was not a fearless, solitary aggressor, hero of a thousand fatal encounters. The only regular unavoidable call on man's aggression was as a protector. That's where men were aggressive. They were as a protector, as infant caring and group protection are the only sexual divisions of labor that invariably obtain in primate or primitive groups. When the first men fought or killed, they did not do so for sport, thrill, or pleasure, but in mortal fear, under life-threatening attack, and fighting for survival. Because group protection was so important a part of man's work, it is essential to question the accepted division by sex of emotional labor, in which all tender and caring feelings are attributed to women, leaving men outside the circle of the campfire as great hairy broods existing only to fight or fuck. In reality, the first men, like the first women, only became human when they learned how to care for others. 
And so women cared for the infants and the children and men cared for the tribe because they would protect the group from, she doesn't say in the book, but I'm thinking maybe from other tribes, maybe from any kind of whatever, I don't know. They were, they were protecting because their men are physically stronger. So that was their job. Men in hunter-gatherer societies do not command or exploit women. They do not appropriate or control their produce nor prevent their free movement. They exert little or no control over women's bodies or those of their children, making no fetish of virginity or chastity and making no demands of women's sexual exclusivity. The common stock of the group knowledge is not reserved for men only, nor is female creativity repressed or denied. So this was the age of the tribes when people cooperated to live in this harsh environment and everybody contributed. And the women were the main providers of the food, the main providers of looking after the children. And they are the ones, we are the ones who evolved to menstruate. And that was the great leap forward because it allowed us to reproduce at a much faster rate than any other primates. Now, she doesn't go into the whole penis thing, but in other books I've read, the reason that there's a mushroom shaped tip at the head of the penis, although I have seen penises that were just pointy, but those would have probably died out because Everybody was fucking everyone. They didn't know what caused pregnancy, and I don't think that they really cared. They were just small tri tribes for survival cooperating. There was like this no jealousy, you're my wife, and whatever. So these um, mushrooms, so when a man, um, okay, primates evolved by being bigger, like the bigger gorilla chases away the other gorilla. That's how they uh, get a turn at the female. But the way that me, human men did it was through their sperm because all humans are about the same size and about the same size as the women. So they don't fight for women and reproductive access through their size or their power or their status or whatever people say. It's through their sperm. So it's sperm competition. So whoever had the best sperm would win because a lot of penises went into a lot of vaginas and so the mushroom shaped tip works like a plunger to pump out the sperm of the pre-existing man. To pump out any sperm that was in that vagina through that mushroom shaped penis to pump it out like a, like a plunger sort of, or like vacuum suck it out. While his ejaculate has um, compounds in it that would destroy other sperm and help his sperm get up into the uterus so early man was promiscuous now did people get jealous i don't know did people have like get sad when someone else fucked their one who liked I, we don't know we don't know this we don't know what feelings they had about it we don't know if they were jealous or sad the way that people are today um, but that's just how we early human lived I think I'm going to end this video with that part and I'm going to, um, uh, the next video will be about the woman as the goddess because what happened is that the woman with her inexplicable moon rhythms and power of creating new life was the most sacred mystery of the tribe. So miraculous, so powerful, she had to be more than man, more than human. There was only one explanation. Woman was the primary symbol, the greatest entity of all, a goddess, no less. And that starts the goddess age, and I'm going to make a separate video for that. So this one is just going to be, I changed my mind, this one is just going to be about first woman and the myth of man, the hunter.